يا سادك يا هنيا يا انت من مالا ترى ما ينقص الا يزيد انت ويانا تذكر وانت صايم Accept Jesus in your life as your savior, as the one you love. Once you've done that, you live happily. You are guaranteed your place in paradise. Now you can sin all you want. He died so that the whole world which is born in sin can be pure of sin. It has some very twisted logic to it. And since he was God who descended from the heavens and at the same time was also the son of God and he was strung upon the cross and killed this killing and the shedding of blood was an atonement and an, and an expiation of all of mankind's sins and she was so afraid seeing that being coming out of nowhere and that being was jibril alayhi salam and she said how can i be pregnant if no man had came near me and isa alayhi salam spoke in that young age he spoke and he said I am the servant of Allah in which Allah had granted me the book and he made me a prophet. Isa alayhi salam is a messenger from Allah to Bani Israel. So he is coming with the orders of Allah Azza wa Jal to Bani Israel for Bani Israel to obey. So fear Allah and obey me. Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So I'm not the Lord and I'm not the son of Lord. I am a human being like you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they planned and plotted. Allah Azza wa Jal is the best of planners. Which one of you is willing to accept to look like me and he'll be with me in the same level and the same level in the paradise? And he said, me. So Isa alayhi salam said, then it's you. At that second, and the disciples are around, this man that looks his original looks turned into the looks of Isa alayhi salam. And at that moment, Isa alayhi salam was elevated to the heavens. They did not kill him. They did not crucify him. But Allah Azza wa Jal made someone look like Isa alayhi salam until the day comes in which Allah will send down Isa alayhi salam in Damascus. He'll come down on two angels coming down to an eastern minaret in Damascus, the white minaret. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the ending of the Dajjal, Antichrist on the hands of Isa. It is time or soon that the son of Maryam will come down and he'll be a just ruler and he'll destroy the cross and he'll kill the, the poor and he'll enforce the jizya, the tax on the non-believers. We are the only other religion that is a tenet of faith that you must believe in Jesus Christ and everything that he did or you cannot be a Muslim. If that is missing, if you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is a tenet of our faith to, to believe in and love Jesus Christ. Adam worshiped God alone. Abraham worshiped God alone, Moses worshiped God alone, Noah worshiped God alone, David worshiped God alone, uh, Jesus worshiped God alone. Jesus never called on Jesus and the last and final prophet Muhammad called on God alone. So therefore we should follow them and call on God alone. Jews and their relationship, Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and his mother. The Prophet Jesus is shown to have suffered greatly at the hands of the very Jewish people to whom he was sent. There's been a great hue and cry. According to Christian tradition, Good Friday, Jesus was tortured, punished, hung upon the cross, to some extent mutilated, and then killed. And since he was God who descended from the heavens, and at the same time was also the son of God and he was strung upon the cross and killed this killing and the shedding of blood was an atonement and an, and an expiation of all of mankind's sins he died so that the whole world which is born in sin can be pure of sin it has some very twisted logic to it because as a result of this belief that everybody is eternally sinful they are born sinful they are born unclean and filthy, full of sin, drowned in sin. But the moment they accept Jesus Christ as their savior, then they are clean and pure because Jesus 
being God and the Son of God at the same time, ascended the cross, allowed himself to be tortured and killed mercilessly in this manner, so that everybody else could be free of sin. So he gave his life as an atonement, as an expiation, as a kafar, as a means of cleaning the whole world's sins. So with this twisted logic, people then have adopted this belief and policy that accept Jesus in your life as your savior, as the one you love. Once you've done that, you live happily. You are guaranteed your place in paradise. Now you can sing all you want. And what does Islam, how do we view Jesus, Prophet Isa alayhi salatu was salam? Allah Azza wa Jal created Isa alayhi salam from a mother and a father. And we mentioned in details the story of Maryam alayhi salam and how she was in the mihrab, in that place of worship, in a room of worship. And out of nowhere and a sudden, some being appeased to her and she was so afraid seeing that being coming out of nowhere. And that being was Jibreel alayhi salam in a figure of a human being. And he gave her the news, the good news that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be creating from her or who will make her fall pregnant to give birth to a child. And she was shocked from that news and she said, how can I be pregnant if no man had came near me? When the pregnancy mark started to appear on her, she left the place of worship that, was she, that, we, that she was in and she went to Bethlehem. She went to a remote, a remote place. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the pregnancy easy on her and she gave birth to that great child Isa alayhi salam and when she came back to her people they saw her with a child knowing that they know that she's not married and she's never been married so where would this child come from and the first thing that came to their mind is the accusation of the evil doings and this is one of the major things that Bani Israel accused Maryam alayhi salam that accused her of fornication that accused her of illegal sex and this is we know this is one of the major sins in Islam and Isa alayhi salam spoke in that young age, early days he spoke and he said that I am the servant of Allah in which Allah had granted me the book and he made me a prophet. And Allah azza wa jal had ordained me to pray, to perform the prayers and to pay the zakat and he had made me a blessing wherever I am. And there Isa alayhi salam grew up with the guardianship and the care of his mother. Of course now father a mother that had passion and care for her son, knowing the destiny of her son. And Isa alayhi salam grew up in Beit Lahim. And Beit Lahim is just a few kilometers away from Jerusalem. And after the day that he spoke, that miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made everyone see, when he was only a few days old, Isa never spoke again until he grew up like every other child grows up and start to speak in the age that every other child speaks. And his mother, she was so cautious on Isa alayhi salam from the envy of Bani Israel, especially the leaders of Bani Israel. And when Isa alayhi salam grew up and became a mature child, his mother was so afraid on Isa alayhi salam and the news started to come out about Isa and the miracle that happened on the hands of Isa. And many of the leaders, especially the religious leaders of Bani Israel, did not accept that tension to be taken away from them to go to a child or a mother. So she used to take him away from the city many times until she went to Jerusalem and she settled in Jerusalem with Isa alayhi salam. In a young age Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had granted Isa alayhi salam the wisdom and the knowledge as he did grant Yahya alayhi salam his cousin from before. And the rumor started to go among Bani Israel that this child Isa, this is where the ending of the corruption of those leaders of Bani Israel. Because Bani Israel were led by corrupt leaders. Even their religious leaders were corrupt. And they wanted to protect themselves. And the news that came out that their ending and the disclosure of their corruption will take place on the hands of Isa alayhi salam. So they start to plot and plan against Isa alayhi salam. And when Isa alayhi salam reached the age of 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him Al-Injil, the Bible. And the Injil came as a confirmation for the Torah. Isa alayhi salam will get a clay, who blow into that clay and that clay will fly, it will turn into a flying bird and a live bird. Bi'ithnillah. He said, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
This is not from Isa alayhi salam himself, but it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are born blind, they can't see. Isa alayhi salam will wipe over their eyes and they see. And one of the great miracles that, that it's been narrated that happened four times at the time of Isa will bring the dead back alive. Bringing the dead back alive. Well, this is a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Isa alayhi salam. He will tell people what their wives just cooked, what they have in their houses, what they have hidden in their cupboards, everything that's inside their houses. And this is some of the unseen knowledge. And Isa alayhi salam is a messenger from Allah to Bani Israel. وَرَسُولًا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ And a messenger to Bani Israel. So he is coming with the orders of Allah Azza wa Jal to Bani Israel for Bani Israel to obey. So fear Allah and obey me. Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So I'm not the Lord and I'm not the son of Lord. I am a human being like you. إِنَّ اللَّهَ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ فَعْمُدُوا Allah is my Lord and He is your Lord. So worship Him. This is a straight path. This make Bani Israel or the majority of Bani Israel follow Isa alayhi salam. It made them become more envious towards Isa alayhi salam. Especially the leaders and the religious leaders of Bani Israel because that's going to take the tension away from them. So the only way they could keep that respect and the only way they could protect that attention they are after is by abolishing Isa alayhi salam. And they start to preach against Isa alayhi salam. When Isa starts to see the disability and disbelief from them, he said, who are the supporters to me? Who are the supporters? Who are my Gospels? Who will stand by me? The disciples said, we are the supporters of Allah. We are your supporters. We believe in Allah and witness that we are Muslims or Allah write us from among those who are witnesses. How many of them? Some narration says 17. The most authentic narration says there were 12. There were 12 disciples who stood by Isa alayhi salam and they were his students alayhi salam. But those 12 disciples, they had some doubt. Like hearing all the rumors and under that peer pressure and under that social pressure around them against the whole world, they had some doubt. Oh Isa, can your Lord send down to us? Can your Lord send down to us from the heavens a table of food? So Isa said, fear Allah, don't you believe in me? We want to eat from it and feel comfortable. Maybe this miracle make us even strong towards you. And we know that you've been honest and truthful towards us and will be from those who witness. So Isa alayhi salam said, send down to us a table of food from the heavens. That will be a celebration or a festival for us. For the first one of us and the last one of us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and said, I will send it down. But whoever disbelieves after it, I will punish them. A punishment that I've never punished anyone before them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down. The disciples are watching a table from the heavens came down with food from the heaven. They sat around it and ate. Now the news started to come out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this miracle on the hands of Isa alayhi salam. And people start to become Muslims. More and more people following Isa alayhi salam. This is becoming a big problem now. Many of the religious leaders are losing customers. They're all going to Isa. And the more Isa is calling, is the more people are following Isa. And these people that were with them one day, they are turning against him. There's got to be some solution. So they planned and plotted. And the only solution is to vanish Isa. What did they do? They got together and planned and went to the king at that time. He was a Roman king assigned by the Roman emperor in Jerusalem. And they went to him saying that there is a man, his name is Isa Jesus. He claims to be the king of Bani Israel. In other words, he's trying to overtake you. So it's either you get rid of him before he gets rid of you. And they planned and plotted and planned and plotted and plotted. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهِ They planned and plotted. Allah Azza wa Jal is the best of planners. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed his messenger Isa alayhi salam of what's happening. And the most authentic narration in that regard has been narrated by Ibn Abbas in which he says when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated Isa alayhi salam to the heavens Isa alayhi salam came out to his disciples 
And there was 12 of them. This is what Abdullah ibn Abbas says. 12 disciples. He came out from his house. Running, his hair was dripping water. And then he said, One of you will disbelieve in me 12 times. And we'll talk about this man. Okay? He will disbelieve in me 12 times after he believed in me. And then he said, Which one of you is willing to look like me? And then he'll be with me like this in the paradise. He'll be with me in the same level in the paradise. This is an indication given to them that the one that's going to look like me is going to suffer. So the youngest one among them said me. So Isa looked at him. He said, not you, sit down. And then he repeated it again. Which one of you is willing to accept to look like me? And he'll be with me in the same level. In the same level in the paradise. So the same young man got up. He said, me. So Isa alayhi salam said, then it's you. At that second, and the disciples are around, this man that looks his original looks, turned into the looks of Isa alayhi salam. And at that moment, Isa alayhi salam was elevated to the heavens. So this is the most authentic narration in that regard. And the soldiers of the Roman king came into the house of Isa alayhi salam, or their gathering, and they took that look alike. And then, back then, the East crucifixion is putting someone on a cross and hammering nails in their body and leaving them like this for the whole day. What happens throughout the whole day? Their lungs collapse. 24 hours, they die from suffocation. And they took the one that looks like Isa, alayhi salam, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ They did not kill him. They did not crucify him. But they looked like him. Allah Azza wa Jal made someone look like Isa alayhi salam and Allah A'lam as I mentioned this is the most authentic narration in that regard Abdullah ibn Abbas he says and then the followers of Isa alayhi salam divided to three they divided to three sects one sect says that Isa is Allah the other sect says Isa is the son of Allah and the third sect says Isa is the servant of Allah and they are the Muslims And then the narration continues, he says, So the two disbelieving sects, the one that said that Isa is Allah or the son of Allah, gained up on the believing sect and fought against them. And that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, We supported those who believed against their enemies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the victory. And the soldiers of the king at that time captured the disciples of Isa alayhi salam. And one of them, Okay. Many of them fled, and one of them was captured and disbelieved in Isa 12 times. Every time they say to him, are you one of his followers? He says, no, 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 12 times as Isa alayhi salam mentioned. And the disciples spread around calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the religion of Isa was covered in closure for 240 years, until a Roman king came and accepted the religion of Isa alayhi salam, with some distortion, he started to make some changes in it, and that's where it continues to the time of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which Allah subhanahu wa taala will send Isa alaihi salam, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, that Isa will come back. It's one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, the coming back of Isa. Isa alaihi salam is still alive, and Allah azza wa jal ascended him to the second heaven, and he's there with his cousin Yahya alaihi salam. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, by the one in which my son is hands, it is time or soon that the son of Maryam will come down and he'll be a just ruler and he'll destroy the, the cross and he'll kill the, the poor and he'll enforce the jizya, the tax on the non-believers. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the son of Maryam, Isa alayhi salam, will live among people for 40 years and rule with justice and Islam and then he'll pass away. In the hereafter, Allah Azza wa Jal will say to Isa and address him, O oh Isa, did you tell people to worship you and your mother and to take you and your mother as lords beside me? So Isa alayhi salam will say, How can I say something that I don't have rights in? If I say it, you know what you have. You know what's inside me, I don't know what's inside you. You are the one that knows the unseen knowledge. 
I only preached and told them and ordered them in what you had ordered me. What you ordered me, I told them. Is to worship Allah, your Lord and my Lord. Ya Allah, if you want to punish them, no, you serve it. You want to forgive them, then you are the one, the great one, Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, the most wise. This is the story of Isa alayhi salam. We are the only other religion that is a tenet of faith that you must believe in Jesus Christ and everything that he did or you cannot be a Muslim. If that is missing, if you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is a tenet of our faith to, to believe in and love Jesus Christ. Beginning at the beginning that Jesus cannot be God and the reason why we are going over this topic is because it's an issue of salvation. We want everyone to be saved. And this issue is a very important issue for Christians, Muslims, Jews, why Jesus cannot be God. And the first number one reason is that God cannot be born. God did not come into existence. He's always existed. He did not come into existence from non-existence. He was not born. He was not created. He has always been before there was even a thing called time. And we, as we all know, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born. He was born without a father. Yes, indeed, that was one of his true miracles. But he was indeed born. He was in the womb for nine months and he was born so that by its very nature shows that he does not have the same quality and characteristics that God has God cannot be born Jesus was born so those two people cannot be one and the same now God when he speaks of things when he talks of his own characteristics and who he is he is very very explicit for instance in, in Isaiah 46 and 9 uh, God says that I am God and then there, no, there is nothing else I am God and there is none like me also, the verses that Jesus quoted, he said, Hear, O Israel, which is one that is quoted in the Jewish synagogues every, every time they have service. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is but one God, and then there is none else. And we all know the verses. You can go through the Old Testament and read about God's characteristics when he describes himself. It is always explicit. Now, there are some verses in the New Testament which can be implicitly interpreted as Jesus having claimed some type of divinity. But if that was such a big characteristic... If it was such a big deal that Jesus was God, if this was the way to salvation, that he was God in the flesh, come to sacrifice himself for the sins of humanity, then that is something God would have been explicit about because it is an issue of salvation. God does not beat around the bush about these type of issues when it comes to who he is. He is very clear with the children of Israel. I am God, there is none like me, do not worship anything else, period. And Jesus came and quoted the same very verses. So if it would have been an issue of salvation that he was God, he would have very clearly stated, I am God. I am God. He would not have told the, the Jews when they said that you call yourself God, he said, you say that I am. He would have very clearly said, yes, I'm God, and I'm here to save you from your sins. He never stated that in anywhere, and it's never referenced in any scriptural text of any religion whatsoever. So therefore, if God is so explicit about his nature, why when it comes to him becoming a man, why did he not explicitly state so? We also believe that Jesus was God's word made manifest. That's what, that's what he is. God said to him, be, and he was. He was God's spoken word on this earth. So we believe that verse. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We believe that verse. We just interpret it in the light of everything else that God has said. When you put it in the light of everything that God has always said, it always makes sense. But if you want to take those verses out and try to prove a point with them, I can say that God doesn't exist and I can go and find you some verses from the Bible, put them together, and be like, look, there's 10 verses right here that show God does not exist. But if you look at these verses analytically along with the explicit verses where God describes his nature and the explicit verses where Jesus describes God's nature, then they become very, very clear cut. The Bible says by God's own word that no one has ever seen God at any time. This is very clear. In John 1 18, it says no man has seen God at any time. In 1 John, no man has seen God at any time. Even Jesus' own statement in John 5 and 37, Jesus says, And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me, and you have neither heard his voice nor seen his face at any time. And Jesus was standing right there amongst them. So had he been God, why would he say you have never seen God at any time? You understand? This is what I'm talking about. This is clear cut. You have never seen God. If he would have been God, he would have said, You're looking at God right now. You want to see God? Look at me. Jesus said, No man hath seen God at any time. And this is also in the Quran. Moses asked to see God in the Quran and he said, look at the mountain. If the mountain can see me, can bear my, my sight, then you can see me. And we know that when God showed himself to the mountain, it crumbled into pieces. And then Moses repented and said, I'm sorry, basically, that I, I, don't, I don't want to see you. We cannot stand to see God. 
God is not something that can come in the form of a human being. I mean, you cannot contain God's essence inside of a physical form. That is to lessen God beyond extent. We see that the early Christians were still a part of Judaism. For instance, when, if you read the book of Acts, when Jesus Christ had, had, had departed from this earth, the disciples still uh, daily attended the synagogue. They still daily went to the temple at Jerusalem and worshipped as the Jews worship because this is what Jesus Christ brought. He brought the renewal of the laws of Moses. So if the disciples were running around teaching people that Jesus was God, they would have been banished out of the temple the day they walked in or they would have started their own church. Jesus went to the temple himself. He did not build his own church anywhere and say, worship me. He went to the temple and worshiped God in the same way that Moses worshiped God, the same way that Abraham worshiped God, the same way that David worshiped God, the same way that Zechariah worshiped God. You know, he did the exact same thing and his disciples followed him. And if you look at the first, second century Christians, they did the same thing. The people of Qumran who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were also a part of Judaism. They considered themselves practicing Jews mm -hmm. who followed Jesus as their prophet. So we see that nothing had changed. This whole concept of Trinity did not come about until the third century of the church and it was not formulated as a doctrine that must be believed in until 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea when um, all of the bishops and the, and, the, and the scholars of Christianity which started to form into Christianity after Paul came together and said okay this is a doctrine that we must believe in and the first person to expound this doctrine was Paul who never saw Jesus Christ himself, never walked with him, never talked to him, never saw him, never ate with him, never learned from him. It was something that he formulated off a vision that he said he had while he was on the road to Damascus to actually persecute Christians. So this he was the first person to ever come up with this title of Christian, ever come up with this title of Trinity, ever come up with the Godship of Jesus Christ or Only Begotten Son. All of these things came with Paul the Apostle. Jesus ate, slept, and prayed. He ate, slept, and prayed, and we know God by His very nature is self-sufficient. He does not need anything to continue His existence. God does not need to eat. God does not need to sleep. God does not need to pray. God is not in need of anything because if He was in need of something, then He would not be God. He would need something else other than Himself to exist that would take away His Godship. And we know that Jesus Christ was born, we know that He ate, we know that He slept, and we know that He prayed. Had He not ate, slept, or drank any water, He would have died. Therefore, he was not self-sufficient. He needed something to continue his existence. Therefore, by his very nature of not being self-sufficient and God being self-sufficient, those two things can't mix. You can't be self-sufficient and not self-sufficient all at the same time. And then Jesus prayed. He was in need of prayer. Anytime he had an issue, he would pray. He would tell the disciples, I need to go pray. Wait here while I pray. Wait here while I pray. He would go to the temple, pray, prostrating on his face on the ground. This in his very nature showed that he was in need of something greater than himself because that is the essence of prayer. It's showing that you're in need of someone who is greater than you. So if Jesus was God, who, why was the need of his prayer? He would have been telling people to pray to him. You need to pray to me. I don't need to pray to anyone. So therefore, by his very nature of necessity, of him being in need of something else, he cannot be God. When he was asked about the hour, the day of judgment, he said, of that day knoweth no man, nor the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father has knowledge of that hour. So if he would have been God, he would have known that. How could God, if the Trinity was indeed true, and God was God, Jesus was God, the Holy Spirit was God, they're all the same person. How does one not know the same information that the other one knows if they are the same person? If God knows the hour, Jesus should know the hour. The Holy Spirit should know the hour. They should have all known that thing, but even Jesus said in another verse, in John 14, 28, he said, the Father is greater than I. He admitted the Father is greater than I. So if they are equals, how can one be greater than the other? Showing that Jesus did not have the exact same knowledge that God has, how could He be God? You see, these are statements that are very explicit. And if you weigh all of these statements against the ambiguous ones, which ones are going to weigh out more? Point blank, explicit, to the point statements, or statements that can be interpreted this way, that way, by anyone who walks and wants to give them an interpretation. These cannot be interpreted any other way than Jesus was not God. He was something less than God. This concept of Trinity cannot be explained to a child. Let's take a six, seven year old child and explain to him the Trinity. He would never con grasp that concept. And God's way of life is something that sh is for everyone. It should be able to be explained to someone who is illiterate. It should be able to explain to someone who has a PhD in rocket science. It should be able to explain to a child. It should be able to explain to a deaf person. But you cannot explain this concept of Trinity. It's a concept that, and, that you can't explain. It's unexplainable. One plus one plus one equals one. Or one times one times one equals one. Explicitly states 
that he is not God. This is the story now of who ate the third loaf of bread. Some of you perhaps have heard this. Our prophet, peace be upon him, taught us that once upon a time that Jesus, peace be upon him, gave some money to one of his companions and he told him to go into town and get some food for everybody. And uh, the man took the money, he went into a town close by, bought the food. There wasn't very much money and all he was able to buy was three loaves of bread. And he was very, very hungry. And he realized that there was just these three loaves of bread. So he decided to eat one loaf of the bread himself. And then when he got back, he just handed the bread over to Jesus, who asked him, who ate the third loaf of bread? And immediately the man said, but there are only two loaves of bread. And Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, didn't say anything else. But they continued on the journey with their companions. Later on, the companions seated, ex succeeded in hunting uh, a deer. And they killed the deer and they were cooking it and eating from the deer. Then Jesus, peace be upon him, he stood up and he asked Allah to bring the deer back to life. And in less than a second, the deer jumped back up and ran away. And the people were amazed that how could this deer that we just killed and we cooked him and we were eating him and then suddenly he just jumps up and runs away. So then Jesus looked at the man who had gone after the bread and he said, I'm asking you by the one who brought this deer back to life. Who ate the third loaf of bread? And immediately the man said there were only two loaves of bread. Again, Jesus, peace be upon him, didn't say anything. And they continued on their journey. Now while they were walking, they came across a river that had been flooded up. Jesus, peace be upon him, asked them to hold his hand. So everybody joined hands with him and they were able to walk across the top of the river and walk all the way to the other side. When they got to the other side, the, the people were amazed, you know, how, how could this be? He said to the same man again, he said, I'm asking you by the one, in other words, I'm asking you by the one who made it for us to be able to cross this river by walking on top of it, who ate the third loaf of bread? And immediately he said, listen, there were only two loaves of bread. So Jesus he didn't say anything again, and they went on. Then they came to a desert. And that's when Jesus, peace be upon him, took three big piles of sand. Then he asked the law, change this into gold. And this man was watching this. And suddenly the piles of sand became piles of gold. And he said, one pile is for me. And he looked at the man and he said, one pile is for you. And the third pile is going to be for the one who ate the third loaf of bread. The man quickly said, I'm the one who ate the third loaf of bread. And Jesus told him, then all three piles of gold are for you. But do not accompany us anymore. But the man didn't care. He was so happy he sat down in front of his new fortune and he started dreaming of what he was going to do with it. He was smiling all alone, looking at his wealth. Suddenly three thieves came upon him and they saw, here's a man sitting alone with this huge treasure of gold. First thing they did, they killed him. Then they divided the gold. Each one of them took one of the big piles of gold. And then they sent one of them to go in and get some food so they could eat and then plan out their future. So one of the thieves, he went to town to buy food. Now he didn't take one of the loaves of bread like the other guy. Instead, he decided to poison the food so when he goes back, the people will eat the poison, they'll die and he'll get all three shares of gold for himself. 
and this is what he did. But his friends, who he'd left behind, were also plotting against him. And they decided that when this man comes back, we'll jump him from the two sides, kill him, and then we'll divide up his share of the gold amongst ourselves. So they killed him when he came back, and then they sat down to enjoy their meal. And they ate the poisoned food. And a few minutes later, they both died. And they all were laying there. When Jesus, peace be upon him, came back with his companions, they passed by the very same spot. And there they saw their former companion laying on the ground. And the other three thieves laying there too. All of them dead. And all three piles of gold laying there. And he pointed to this and he said, This is the life of this world. In the Arabic called Al Hayat al Dunya. This is the life of this world. And this is what it will do for those who seek after it.